Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Johnny Coker. On today's episode, we're taking a look at food insecurity in our region. What's being done to solve the issue of hunger? And where can individuals find help? I have more in this report. With the holidays around the corner and temperatures dropping in the high desert, finding a hot meal can be difficult for some New Mexicans. To help address the need of hunger in Las Cruces, El Caldito Soup Kitchen on the Community of Hope campus serves hot meals seven days a week to those in need. Sky Annie Miller said she recently lost her apartment in TRC, so she came to El Caldito for help in her time of need. This is a special place. The word caring comes to mind, and it's not that often that you feel people really care about you. There's also just a sense of community among the people. I've talked to more people in one each day than I did in the last six years alone in an apartment. But these people, it's like they seem to provide more than we could even think about. According to a report by the New Mexico Coalition to End Homelessness, the number of individuals experiencing homelessness rose 12.9 percent between 2022 and 2023. This, combined with rising food insecurity in rural areas of the state, have made places like El Caldito a beacon of hope for those who need assistance. I think it's a wonderful thing and every community should have something like it so that people are fed when it's cold, when it's hot. It's just, it's just people caring. People caring about people that in other places they want to be invisible. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, an average of 11.2 percent of New Mexico households were food insecure between 2020 and 2022. For those with the ability to house and cook for themselves, food pantries like Casa de Peregrinos are an important resource, especially with the loss of emergency SNAP benefits earlier this year. But for individuals without those luxuries like Aaron Myrick, the soup kitchen is often the only place to get a hot meal. It's a balanced diet. It's real good. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's fancier restaurants that might be better, but everybody is, is real sweet in there. Yeah, they're, they're, they, don't, they don't look down your, your, their nose, you know. You know they, they treat you just like one of their own. Laura Alvarado is the business administrator at El Caldito. She said that volunteers serve as many as 350 hot lunches per day, and that's on top of the new breakfast program that operates every weekday. And it's not just adults or people my age that come in. We have families that come in with babies a um, couple months old to just a family of kids and, and mom and dad. The need is very real right now. I think a lot of us are so busy thinking about our holidays, about Thanksgiving, about Christmas, but let's not forget the, the less fortunate in our community. Alvarado said that the soup kitchen holds a special place in her heart because it wasn't long ago that her family needed the assistance. We never know what our neighbor needs or we just never know. We just, we just never know the cross that somebody else is carrying. So this is like my home because that's the place that helped me. Casa de Peregrinos helped me when we were little. I remember that. And then once I, I mean, three years ago, I just went through a rough patch and they were here for me. In the midst of rising poverty around the state, Alvarado said there's always a need for volunteers and resources, whether it's during the holidays or any other time of the year. Joining us now to talk about food insecurity is the director of Casa de Peregrinos Food Pantry, Lorenzo Alba Jr. Lorenzo, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So just to start off, can you give us, for, for viewers that may not know, can you give them a brief overview of what Casa de Peregrinos is and your role in the community? Absolutely. We are one of New Mexico's longest running and oldest uh, food pantry. We've been around since 1979. Uh, in our community, serving the community, we not only serve Las Cruces, but the greater Doñana County uh, area uh, with a uh, number of programs uh, through that. Uh, we have the food security program, which is here locally in Las Cruces. We also have a rural program, which includes 13 uh, rural pantries, as well as a student pantries here in town and the senior centers um, also here in town. Uh, those, are, those allow us to be able to pretty much 
pick up on every demographic we need to pick up on uh, that are going through food insecurity issues in our county. Just talking about rural communities, in terms of food insecurity, it seems like those rates are much higher the further away you get from population centers. So how exactly are y'all tackling that issue of food insecurity in rural communities? You know, it, it is an issue in the rural communities for a number of reasons. First of all, um, let me just kind of back up a little bit. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is because they're virtual food deserts. In a nutshell, there's not enough grocery stores in those areas. They have to travel to go to a grocery store and get to kind of that, kind of get to that kind of situation. They have to go to either Anthony or Las Cruces, some, to, some go to El Paso. What we're trying to do is bring infrastructure to those areas. Um, it is part of our vision to build a system here in our county with infrastructure that allow us to reach more people. There's around 60,000 people that are going through food, in, uh, that are lingering in the poverty levels here in Doñana County. Food insecure people, probably about 35, 40,000. I think it's a big number. I know NMSC's done a study and they, I think their study said about 31 or 32,000 people were going through food insecurity in our county. I think the number's a little bit higher than that. Uh, we're trying to tackle it by adding infrastructure. We have plans. Part of those plans are in the northern part of the county with a uh, new pantry and hatch, which we are gonna launch next week. Uh, we also have uh, a project in Sunland Park with the uh, city of Sunland Park. It's a capital outlay project, kind of like the one that we did here in Las Cruces. It's a smaller version of it, but we'll actually be able to have infrastructure there to be actually have office hours there. There's a lot of people that are food insecure, especially in that southern part of the county. And the new one we're looking at right now is in the Chaparral area. We've been in talks with a couple of legislators as well as um, the county to try to build something in that area. And that area is tough. Um, we were talking a landlocked area. How do you get in and out easily? It's a tough area. It's in three counties, if you include Otero County, Doyana County, and El Paso County. So it's uh, definitely a, it's gonna be a challenge for a lot of people. We want to do that. We want to add that infrastructure, make it easy for people. We want to go to them instead of them coming to us. Mm -hmm. And you talk about these projects, and I know these, team, these things do take time to develop and build. Do you have any sort of timeline in terms of each of these projects, or is it all still just sort of in the very early processes? We have some timelines. Uh, uh, for like example, in Sunland Park, we feel very strongly that winter of 2025 will be when we can open those, that facility. We're looking at about the same kind of timeline for uh, Chaparral if that does happen. Chaparral will be more of a phased project, so we'll build, we'll build something like a warehouse first you know, to distribute food, and then we'll add offices later on. I think getting the food there is more important than us having offices there to be able to really manage uh, the site. Uh, we can still manage it from afar, or with some assistance from the county's other facilities in that area. Uh, but we're looking at around the same time for those facilities. We also have a big project here in um, Las Cruces, which includes El Caldito Soup Kitchen to build a brand new kitchen for them. Some kitchens for us so that those kitchens can be used uh, to, for food prep for homebound uh, folks that, that need assistance, for uh, homeless, instead of giving them just snack food, we can even prep meals that they can take to a microwave, microwave and eat. We're looking at uh, prepping meals for people that have certain health conditions. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're able to do those kind of things out of those kitchens. That project is enormous. That's, that is a collaboration with the city of Las Cruces and El Calito Soup Kitchen. And, uh, it's gonna be a pretty hefty project. We're also going to Santa Fe to be asking for funding for that. But uh, definitely concentrating on the rural communities right now. I think it's important that we get to those areas. Like I said, Hatch will be opening up next week. We've got Capital Outlay coming to us at some point uh, in the spring, as well as some uh, congressional uh, funding from Representative Gabe Vasquez, which we're super excited about because I think we're gonna be able to do some good things up in the northern part of the county. Mm -hmm. And you talk about you know, going up to Santa Fe and, and these federal legislators. How supported do you feel from, you know, both a local level all the way up to the federal level by policymakers in terms of your mission? How, how do you feel like more could be done or do you feel? I'll be honest with you, I think the biggest uh, supporters are the local legislators. 
They support our mission. They support what our efforts. They're really doing the best that they can to make sure that some of these projects get off the ground and more importantly, get completed. And I think that's the key to it. They want to see these projects, you know, come to fruition. They want to see them completed. And uh, they're big supporters. They come by and see what we're doing. We're in communication constantly about what's happening with food and security in our area. Uh, we'd like to get a little more support from the governor's office. I think that would be great. Uh, we want her to be part of what we're doing. Uh, we want her initiative on food insecurity to be part of what we are doing in building this system here in Doñana County. We are the second most populous area in the state and I feel like we need a lot more support uh, from the folks up north especially that are in leadership positions. So we're going to ask the governor for support on, this, on these projects and I think uh, it's a good thing because we've already completed one. We can, we've already shown that we can complete a project like this. Um, as far as um, help from the from the from our delegation in Washington D.C., we absolutely get a lot of support from them. I just came back from a couple of months ago from visiting with them, and they didn't know what what kind of projects that we are doing here and some of the assistance that we need. And they're all very supportive, all of them. Everybody that I visited with there was really supportive of what Casa de Peregrinos is trying to do in Doñana County in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Casa de Peregrinos recently, in the last six or seven months, opened up uh, a big new facility. And y you talk about that, sh sharing that with legislators and things like that. How exactly, how a has it impacted y'all? Um, what kind of impact has that made for, you know, your efforts throughout the community? I think we spoke about this before, but I, I, I think it opens up the way that we distribute food to, to the community. There's different ways that people can come pick up food or, or receive food from us now uh, because of the size of this facility and the space that we have to work the programs. Uh, the numbers have just absolutely jumped out in front of us. Since we opened in August, the numbers have jumped quite a bit. Uh, just in the last quarter of this year, the numbers have really, really, really gone up. Uh, in the last few weeks, we've seen some pretty big numbers. Uh, it's just, uh, I think people feel comfortable there. It's, it's an inviting facility. It makes people feel safe when they come to Casa Peregrinos. So th it's, it's just going to be a very good thing for the community for a long time. It's going to serve as a great headquarters for some of these other projects that we're trying to get off the ground as well. So we hope that other communities will take a look at what we're doing and hopefully try to address food insecurity in the same manner. This building is actually a tribute to a lot of work by a lot of people. Uh, to make this happen, and it includes our friends over at the City of Las Cruces, but also our friends at the Community of Hope. You know, the other agencies there have been very supportive of what we've done there. Community of Hope, Amador Health Center, Jardín de los Niños, and of course, uh, El Caldito Soup Kitchen. So I think it pays dividends in the long run. Mm -hmm. And you talk about those partners that you have on the Community of Hope campus. Can you just go a little bit more into your relationship with them, especially uh, El Caldito being, sure. you know, a food I mean, we've security. always supported them by, you know, providing food for some of the, what they're doing with their mission, uh, storage space. Uh, now we're working on this capital outlay project, you know, to build a brand new soup kitchen and some other kitchens. I, I think though that relationship has gone a long ways. Now with Community of Hope, of course, we provide food for some of their transitional homes and of course all their clients as well. It's the same relationship that we have with Jardín de los Niños. I mean, their clients receive food from us. We assist them with some of their food programs and uh, some of the special holiday projects that we've had in the past with them. Amador Health Center, every once in a while, we get to help them out with some healthy snacks, as well as uh, providing uh, basically a platform for them to see some of our clients that need their services as well. So we work hand in hand. All of them work really hard to make sure that we're addressing all the social issues and health issues that are going on in our area. Mm -hmm. And I understand, I think you mentioned earlier that El Caldito is planning on having a similar expansion as Casa de Peregrinos. Can you, how much do you know about those plans and um, how much can you share with us, I guess? I know that we need, I know that we need about 11 to 12 million dollars to complete the project. Last year we got 1.9 million to begin planning and design of the facility. Uh, this is an important project for the city of Las Cruces and Community of Hope. And we just are trying to get this off the ground now to really, really make a big impact on what we're doing locally. 
it's going to change the dynamic of the campus once this new facility goes up. And I think that that's an important process that we need to all go through to see that this change is needed, this infrastructure is needed in order for us to move forward and expand on the programs that we are doing. They need it. They need the space. They definitely need the space. They need a state-of-the-art kitchen to be able to feed more people and to really expand on what they're doing. You know, they're doing a couple of meals a day. They should be doing three meals a day. We hope that that's what happens every day so that uh, folks can have somewhere to come get food uh, and when they're hungry, a nice hot meal uh, out of this beautiful facility, they'll be able to do some, some really special things. So we're moving forward with it and we hope that our friends in Santa Fe listen to us. Mm -hmm. And I know during when you were giving me a tour of Casa de Peregrinos' new facilities, there is a kitchen in there and you said it was gonna be used for nutritional education and teaching people how to cook certain dishes that they may not know how to cook. Um, how is that going and, and what, how is that important? We're beginning the planning process on that now. We've got in that kitchen and cooked a couple of times already, but uh, that's the process that we're going through now, trying to figure out exactly where we want to start. Uh, we're looking right now at hopefully trying to find a student uh, from NMSU Dietetics Program to come be the first big employee there. Uh, we're hoping to do something with them in the spring of this coming year so that we can begin to move forward with that nutrition program. We've got a lot of great plans for it. We also, in that nutrition aspect of it, want to include uh, the community schools that we're at as well. We're at eight community schools currently, and we want to make sure that they're part of that nutrition program as well. Mm -hmm. And speaking with public health officials, I mean, this is a really big issue. It's not just food insecurity, but food deserts, obviously, you want people, and something that y'all supply is a lot of fresh food and good food like that. Um, can you just speak of, you know, how important it is for these people to be able to have fresh food and fresh greens and not necessarily just boxed food oh and my gosh. sodium rich things? We are committed and we've done a really good job over the last 10 years to really do the best that we can to spend most of the money that comes in on fresh food. We buy produce, we buy dairy products, we buy protein items. We try to go to local farmers when we can. We, if we can't do it, then we you know, use wholesalers to make sure that we're getting all the right food in here. Uh, it's been something that was recommended actually by some dietetic students from N NMSU years ago. They made that recommendation to us. So some of our staples have changed into more nutritious food than the typical st staples, which are usually like just beans and rice and manteca and flour and things that were a little bit, you know, more culturally correct at the time, but we need to go more into the nutritious foods and produce is a way to do it. Definitely an important aspect of what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and something that I wanted to give you a bit of a platform for, I mean, we're smack dab in the middle of the holiday season. For people that want to help or that for both people that want to help and people that need help with food um, insecurity, where can they go? What should be the first thing they do? You know what, I would recommend giving us a call at 575-523-5542. Call our offices and ask, you know, do you have pantries in, our, in communities near where we are located? And we can give you a full update of where they're located, where you can go, what day they happen, because they're mobile food pantries currently. That's another reason for building those facilities so that we can actually open more often and be available for them more often. Um, they can start there. That's a really good way to do it. They can go on to our social network, into Facebook, Instagram. They can go into our LinkedIn. They can go into our Twitter. They can check uh, through there to see what we're doing. And also our website at uh, casaperegrinos.org. And come take a look at some of the things that we're doing. Look at the schedules. If you want to get involved, make a donation, go to the website, give us a call. If you want to get involved by volunteering, there's a place where you can sign up for volunteering on the website as well. Or you can come by and just uh, talk to Crystal Portillo about volunteering and she'll set, look at a schedule and see what's going to work for you. We're always in need of volunteers. That's one of the things that we lack the most right now is enough volunteers. With this bigger facility as we were talking about earlier, we need more volunteers. We're doing a lot of different uh, ways to distribute the food and with that comes uh, uh, the need for more volunteers, so absolutely. Of course, we need advocates. We need people that are talking about what we're doing all the time. We need people to talk to the legislators, to our leaders, 
to this community and to other agencies that can help us with this mission. Because alone we can't do it. With all the partners that we have, it's even a challenge with that. So we need more folks to be involved, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk, we've talked a few times about legislators so far, and I wanted to ask about the Farm Bill um, from your perspective. I mean, this is such a big piece of legislation. What, do you, what, would your, um, what would you say to legislators about what needs to be in that Farm Bill to help people in places like Las Cruces and beyond within the rural communities? From the food insecurity aspect, you absolutely need to make sure that that goes through as quickly as possible because that is what funds the SNAP program. That's what funds a commodities program. We need to have that pass as quickly as possible so that that can continue seamlessly. You have a lot of years to plan ahead and uh, the delegation always struggles with passing it because the budget doesn't pass. I, I think it's important to pass those pieces up front, come to an agreement on how they're gonna run. Also, there's gonna be a major changes to, to SNAP or any of those programs that really help uh, the nutrition programs. There needs to be a better rollout. You need to roll out the slowly so that people can get used to the changes on it. I think that's the most difficult part is that they make a decision, they go ahead and just get it started, but the rollout is so quickly that people don't have enough time to make adjustments to their budgets, make adjustments to how they live uh, in a timely manner. It, it, it has a major effect on what's going on there. Uh, the other piece is that make sure that we protect the farmers because without the farmers, there's no food. Mm -hmm. We need to have enough insurance for them for any kind of crisis, any kind of disaster, crop insurance. We need to make sure that these insurance can cross each other so that if they experience either or the other, they're not stuck without being able to use one of them. Uh, the farmers are the key to this. Uh, it's, that's why they call it the farm bill. Mm -hmm. Even though it's under, a uh, nutrition programs under there, the farmers are the most important piece in my opinion. Certainly. If you don't protect them, I think it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. And so we only have about a minute left, but I want you, I, I just want to give you a bit of a platform. What is your message to the people of Las Cruces, Southern New Mexico and far West Texas about what they can do this holiday season to, um, you know, to find help if they need it? Send them our way. We want to help. We're here for this community. We built this facility in Las Cruces for this community. Uh, we're here for you. We're going to be here as long as we can be here. We need uh, donations always. We need volunteers always. This mission is not done alone, and this community has always been very generous and helpful and kind to us. I think we can continue to help a lot of people, but come see us. Let us take care of you. Let us try to help your family through the tough times. Lorenzo Alba, Jr. is the executive director of Casa de Peregrinos Food Pantry. Lorenzo, thanks so much for being thanks with so us Thanks so much today. for having me. I appreciate you so much. And now moving on, the annual Marine Corps Reserve Toys for Tots of Las Cruces is a local nonprofit organization in charge of distributing 18,000 books, toys, and board games to more than 5,600 children in the local school districts. Producer Christian Valle brings us this community connection explaining how this organization has been collecting and distributing toys to the children of the area for the past 25 years. The mission of Toys for Tots is to provide the magic of the season to as many children as we can. So last year we gave out over 18,000 items to over 5,600 kids. And so we need lots of toys. It's hard for me to decide which child gets the bike and which child gets the Mr. Potato Head. So $10, $20 toys and lots of them is what we really need. And then we have a formula, every child receives three or four toys, and we don't want every child in a certain neighborhood to wake up and they all got a football, so we're pretty careful trying to give different things uh, to different children. 
That's what my volunteers are doing right now. I get to deliver the collection boxes throughout the city. We spread out approximately 150 boxes through different uh, various businesses, CVS, Walgreens, UPS stores, postal service, what have you. And uh, they'll call me, tell me the box is either full, and or we will set a date that I'm gonna pick up the rest of the boxes so we can uh, gather them up, count them, and uh, inventory everything we've got because that's a requirement by the uh, Toys for Tots Foundation. New unwrapped toys, and people will ask me, say, why are they unwrapped? So we can identify what kind of toy it is and who to distribute it to. And so that's why we require that. The way we identify the kids now, rather than uh, handing out individual gifts to the child, we, uh, we coordinate with the different schools. There's 42 schools that we do and the, uh, the teacher identifies the children that are in need, and they, as not only the child, but the child, if he has siblings, they're identified as well. They compile a list, submit that to the counselor at the school. He makes up a list, and they submit it to us, and we attempt to uh, deliver as many toys as we can or fill that list as possible. And we provide toys from uh, ages zero through 14 years of age, boys and girls. It's a large task and it involves a lot of work, but it's a very good endeavor for anyone that is interested in helping out the community. If you want to join us, by all means, come see us. Also, we never get enough for the older kids because people hear tots and they donate for three to five year olds. Um, we always need stuff for older kids and that's also why we need money. I get such good discounts that I can buy in bulk. Money helps too. And then we always need volunteers. I need young people, NMSU students. We need trucks all the time. We're on Facebook at Las Cruces uh, Toys for Tots. I'm happy to share my phone number, 575-202-6185. There is also uh, toysfortots.org but you have to find Donana County in New Mexico. So we wanna keep them here if we can. This is the best thing I've ever done. It does so much for me and helping other people is really what the holiday season is about. And it just feels good, I think. <laughs> That's our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition 5 to 9, Fresh Air at 11, followed by Here and Now, Noon to 2, and All Things Considered 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. And we'd like to hear from you. Email us with story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Johnny Coker. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.